This is a video about overwater propagation as it relates to jamming a radar homing anti-ship missile. Now suppose a uh, radar homing missile is attacking a ship and the ship has a jammer to defend itself against the missile. The jammer receives pulses from the missile seeker and the seeker receives jamming signals from the jammer. It's a contest between them. The missile is furiously trying to compute a fire control solution and the jammer is furiously trying to compute an inverse solution. And basically it's a race to see who gets there first. Now the radio signals from both the jammer and the seeker will be reflected by the sea surface. That's called multipath because there's more than one path for the signal to follow from the transmit antenna into the receive antenna, from the jammer to the seeker antenna or from the seeker from the jammer, same thing. There's a direct path and a path that includes the reflection from the sea surface, so two paths, multipath. The signals from the direct and indirect paths combine coherently at the receive antenna, either the jammer or the seeker, and the phase and amplitude differences between these two signals will cause this received signal to vary in amplitude as the lengths of the two paths change. In other words, as the missile approaches the ship. Now, amplitude variation, that's called scintillation. Scintillation is important to the jammer because it can cause the jammer's signal to disappear as seen by the seeker. This happens if the direct and indirect paths cancel each other. It's called a multipath fade. It means that propagation, you know, multipath, can cause the jammer signal to disappear as seen by the seeker. Now, if we look in the reverse direction, from the seeker to the jammer, the same thing can happen. Multipath can cause the seeker to disappear as seen by the jammer. Now this is important because in order for the jammer to jam the seeker, it has to detect the seeker's RF signals and multipath can cause them to disappear. Now let's change gears and talk about the skin echo from the ship. That's the thing, the signal seen by the, uh, by the missile seeker for the target signal. Now it comes from the addition of all of the, the skin echo comes from the reflections of all the reflections uh, of, of the scatterers on the ship. Each reflector on the ship contributes a little bit, um, each one having a different phase and amplitude from all the rest. The result is that the skin echo naturally scintillates as the missile approaches the ship, even without propagation. And it happens because the path length to each one of those reflecting points is changing and they're all different. Now, whereas the seeker and the jammer are effectively point sources, the ship target is a collection of reflectors distributed along the projected width and height of the ship. That they're spatially distributed. The important part of the story is that, that it's not necessary to apply propagation to each one of these little reflectors. The reason is that because there are so many of them, although you only need about 10 to represent a ship, that'll do, the effect of propagation kind of averages out. I mean, it's a bit more complicated than that, than that but, but that's the gist. Let's look at an example. Here's an X-band sea skimmer missile attacking a tanker-sized ship. The ship is represented by 10 reflectors and propagation is not applied to each of the reflectors. And here's the same flyout, but with propagation applied to each of the reflectors. There's a gain difference, which I have to chase down, but overall the scintillation characteristics appear the same or effectively identical. And remember that even without multipath, the skin echo will vibrate or scintillate because of the interaction of all those little reflectors. So, how do we calculate the effect of multipath? Well, it's pretty easy to find a suitably accurate ray tracing model of propagation online, and it's, and it's pretty straightforward to code it also. And, and by the way, a ray tracing model will do for you know, most purposes, at least the purposes I'm going to talk about. The mathematical equations specify, you know, firstly, the location of the specular reflection point on the sea surface, and secondly, the reflection coefficient at the specular point. The reflection coefficient is the multiplication of three complex terms the Fresnel reflection coefficient, the specular reflection coefficient, and something called the divergence factor. The reflection coefficient depends also on polarization. It's different for horizontal and vertical, and it depends on how rough the sea surface is and some other things like temperature and salinity and so forth. Now, ENGAGE uses the AREPS, A-R-E-P-S, set of equations, which stands for Advanced Reflective uh, Effects Prediction System. I think that's right. Uh, and it was formerly called the Engineer's Reflective Effects Prediction System, or EREPS, but it was renamed AREPS a bunch of years ago. Basically, it treats the Earth as a billiard ball roughened by surface waves. And I've sometimes seen surface waves called capillary waves. 
Anyway, the surface waves are the waves you see when you stand on the deck of a boat and you look out at the water. Those are the waves we're talking about. And uh, you know, the higher the wind, the bigger the surface waves, and the height of the waves is sometimes called the sea state. So let's call this the, the ARAPS model. Let's call this a curved Earth model because the sea surface is, is part of a sphere. Now, if you code up the equations and apply them, for example, to a sea skimming missile, the jammer power at the seeker antenna terminals looks like this graph here. The amplitude of this signal is determined by the jammer transmitter power and the gain of the jammer's transmit antenna and the gain of the seeker antenna. And we can do the same thing for the seeker power at the jammer. It looks like this. It's the same overall shape, but the amplitude is different because it's determined by the seeker and transmitter power and the seeker antenna gain and the gain of the jammer's receive antenna the other side of the coin. So let's look at the seeker power at the jammer in the Engage A-scope application so we can change things like missile altitude and radio frequency and wind speed and see how it affects the power versus range, just like in an animation. So here's the effect of missile altitude. As the missile height increases, the propagation nulls move outward, and there are more of them. And uh, when the altitude goes down, the reverse happens. When the frequency goes up, the wavelength gets shorter. So the geometry, from, from a geometry point of view, it's like increasing the missile altitude. Now that's not the only effect since the reflection coefficient depends on the frequency, but that's the biggest one. We can see it here. When the wind blows, the sea surface gets rough. So the reflection coefficient changes. This tends to fill in the multipath nulls. Uh, and the more wind there is, the higher the waves, the shallower will be the nulls. Now, hopefully it will have escaped no one's attention that these graphs of power versus range don't look particularly realistic. They just look, you know, too perfect, too smooth, no noise. And they certainly don't look like the kind of measurements we see in air carry tests, although I don't have any of that kind of data. Uh, but I have seen it before. Um, the predicted power looks, you know, more realistic when a small change is made to the propagation model. And in this video is not the place to discuss what that change is. I just want to point out that it's possible to create a more realistic prediction of propagation effects. Now, this realism is important for things like jog detection and other advanced technologies for real-time in-combat ECM effectiveness assessment. So what's a jog detector? A jog detector senses seeker antenna deflections caused by ECM by noticing a drop in the measured seeker power when the antenna deflection happens. This is one example of the real-time effectiveness feedback I referred to before. The trick, though, with a jog detector is that multipath also causes drops in measured seeker power, so the jog detector has to distinguish between the two. Most of these technologies suffer from poor understanding by the practitioners and a lack of insight by, on behalf of the, by the practitioners. Uh, and that's led them to be either discredited or, or believed to be completely impossible, incorrectly. Check assumptions. You never know what's going to turn up. You never know what other people have missed because they didn't check. And by checking, I, means, I mean either doing the calculations, the hard thing, doing the calculations, or doing the experiment, and usually it's both. All the results so far have the sea surface between the transmitter and receiver as part of, as part of a sphere. So here's a question. Is this a correct representation of the sea surface shape? According to the open literature, the sea surface is better represented by corrugations which are wrapped onto a spherical surface, with the surface waves riding on top of the corrugations. The corrugations are called sea swells. Sea swells are long period, long wavelength, low amplitude waves. For example, the period might be 15 seconds, and the wavelength might be a half a kilometer long or more, and the amplitude might be much less than a meter. So the slow, long, big waves on which the little waves ride. The main difference between the sea swell model and the curved earth model is that whereas the curved earth model only allows for a single specular reflection point, the sea swell model allows for multiple reflection points. In a ray tracing model, the specular reflection point is determined by Snell's law. It occurs where the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And on, this, on, a, on a sphere, that's satisfied at only one point. But if the sea surface is represented by a sinusoid that's wrapped onto the sphere, then there are multiple crests and multiple troughs, so there can be multiple reflection points. Now here's what the reflection points looks like for a curved Earth model. The reflection point is the white X on the sea surface.
And here's what the reflection points look like for a seesaw model. In the seesaw case, the size of the X's, those white X's at each reflection point, is proportional to the amplitude of the, the reflection coefficient at each point. That's just a graphic I decided to add. Anyway, the basic idea of the C-swell model is to automatically provide a correct correlation between the engagement geometry, C conditions, and signal scintillation at the receiver. I created a mathematical model for a C-swell propagation that's not online, uh, and then I coded it into a DLL and used it in Engage. The derivation and the coding are a bit tricky uh, because there is no closed-loop solution for finding where the specular points are, and even after you find all the candidate reflection points, then not all of them are admissible because there can be shadowing by wave crests and so forth. So here's what uh, Jammer Power in the Seeker looks like for an example C-swell configuration. This is the effect of changing missile altitude. This is the effect of varying C-swell amplitude. Here's what happens if we change the radio frequency. Let's go back to X-band. Now as a sanity check, the C-swell model should converge to the curved Earth model as the C-swell amplitude goes to zero. And it does. It should also converge as the C-swell wavelength becomes very large. And it does. And this concludes a brief discussion of some aspects of overwater propagation and a missile engagement.